All right. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? So I wanted to let you know, since you're probably already working on the second lab, I posted like an example solution to lab one. So you can kind of like read through that if you weren't exactly sure what we were looking for on the lab. And then you can maybe take a look at that before you write your second lab. Um, and then also I just wanted to kind of mention that the page length suggestions that we gave were just suggestions. It's not like a hard minimum or maximum, um, but just kind of like a target length. And if you find that you need to be longer than like five to six pages to really get all of the concepts and all the information in there that you think should be in there, then make it longer. That's fine. Yeah. And for the second one, I'm expecting that it might be a little bit longer than the first one. I think for the first one, the solution that I wrote up was five pages, but it was like, you know, decently condensed kind of format. So it depends on, you know, if you like double space everything and whatnot. Okay. All right, so we'll start back um, talking about correlations for the Nusel number <coughs> and the friction coefficient over flat plates. So we were talking about um, kind of writing down these correlations on how to calculate different things like the boundary layer thickness, the shear stress, the friction coefficient, and Nusel number, both local and spatially averaged over flat plates, so external flow over flat plate. First we talked about um, in laminar flow, and then we acknowledged that there's going to be a transition to turbulence at some critical X location downstream of the leading edge of the plate, and then you're going to have to be able to handle turbulent a turbulent boundary layer, which there are separate correlations for that. Um, so we are writing down those and got about halfway through. So I'm just going to continue. We've got like a couple more equations to write down for this. So I'm just going to continue writing that on this same um, sheet of notes from last week, uh, just so we have all the equations together and then switch over um, when we kind of finish this topic. So we wrote down turbulent flow over flat isothermal plate. And we said, so these equations are going to apply to the position along the plate after the critical X location until the end of the plate. And then we have expressions for the local friction coefficient as a function of Reynolds number that's applicable in this range of Reynolds numbers. And then also the velocity boundary layer thickness as a function of Reynolds number. And we mentioned how this is not a function of panel number because in the turbulent boundary layer, um, really the development of the boundary layer is affected much more by turbulent mixing than by diffusion. Um, so the thickness isn't governed by the panel number which we talked about is kind of that ratio of momentum to energy diffusion. Okay, so we can also write down an expression for the local thermal boundary layer thickness. And in a turbulent flow, that's actually just approximately equal to the velocity boundary layer thickness. And again, that's kind of due to that turbulent mixing, um, kind of governing the uh, development of the boundary layer rather than diffusion. And we are, of course, interested in the Nusel number. So we'll write down the expression for the local Nusel number in turbulent flow or in a turbulent boundary layer. And that is 0 0.0296 times the Reynolds number to the four fifths times the Prandtl number to the one third. And this is applicable for 
Reynolds numbers between approximately 0 0.6 and 60. So for the laminar flow, we also, so we wrote down the local expressions and then the average expressions. Um, for a turbulent flow, we've only written down the local expressions, and that's because if you're wanting to consider the average Neusel number over an entire plate, you're going to have both laminar and turbulent conditions. So just writing the average for just the turbulent region doesn't, isn't usually very helpful. So we're going to talk next about um, expressions for mixed boundary layer conditions, where you have laminar and then turbulent. And if you want to take the average, uh, or calculate the average Neusel number over the entire plate, or a region that encompasses both the laminar and the turbulent region. Um, so it is quite feasible that you know at lower Reynolds number, you would have a laminar flow all the way over a plate. So you have expressions for the local Neusel number for that. But turbulent flow is pretty much always going to be preceded by a region of laminar flow. So we'll talk about mixed conditions. And for this, I'll go ahead and switch over to kind of a new section. Okay, so this is mixed boundary layer conditions. And then remind ourselves that we're still talking about external flow over a flat isothermal plate. Okay, so the first situation, kind of the simplest situation that you would have um, for mixed boundary layer conditions is if you have transition to turbulence occurring in kind of the last 5% of the plate. So after like 95% of its length, if the transition occurs there, you can just use the laminar boundary layer equations with you know, two very good approximation because the turbulent um, boundary layer is over such a small region of the plate that it doesn't have a big impact on the average conditions. So we'll say if transition to turbulence occurs at 0.95 to 1, so 95 to 100% of the length of the plate. You can use the average parameters for laminar flow, or the, say, average expressions. But if it occurs upstream of the last like 5% of the plate, you have to consider both the laminar and the turbulent regions impacting the spatial average. So if the transition occurs upstream, of 0 0.95 times the length 
have to consider both laminar and turbulent regions. And this is done by integrating the local coefficient for laminar flow over the length um, at which the boundary layer remains laminar, and then adding it to uh, kind of the integral of the local coefficient for turbulent flow over the um, length that it, the boundary layer is turbulent. And that's done for all of the different um, coefficients. But just kind of as an explanation for how this expression is derived, for example, for the convection coefficient, H, the average, the spatially average coefficient is derived by integrating the local coefficient for laminar flow from um, the leading edge until the critical X location or the, um, the transition point and then adding that to the local coefficient in turbulent flow integrated from <coughs> the transition point to the end of the plate. So doing that for the friction coefficient and the Neusel number, we now get expressions for the average Neusel number and that is going to be written with an overbar here as a reminder that it's an average and that's 0 0.037 times the Reynolds number to the four-fifths minus A, which we'll talk about how A is defined, times the Prandtl number to the one-third. And that is relevant for Prandtl numbers in this range of 0 0.6 to 60. And then <coughs> Reynolds numbers between the critical Reynolds number and 10 to the 8th. And A is, um, so to account for kind of where the transition to turbulence occurs, that's why this A uh, value is in there. And so it's a function of the critical Reynolds number. So it's 0 0.037 times the critical Reynolds number to the 4 fifths minus 0 0.664 times the critical Reynolds number to the 1 half. So 0 0.037 times critical Reynolds number to the 4 fifths minus 0.664 times critical Reynolds number to the one half. For flow over a flat plate, we have said that the critical Reynolds number, so where transition to turbulence occurs, is five times 10 to the fifth. So we can just calculate this A um, for kind of all flat plate geometries. So for a critical Reynolds number of 5 times 10 to the 5th, A equals 871. So this just becomes 871 right here. <coughs> we can do the same process of integration for the friction coefficient and come up with especially averaged friction coefficient over a plate that includes both laminar and turbulent boundary layers. 
and that is 0 0.074 times the Reynolds number to the negative one-fifth minus 2a over the Reynolds number. This is the same a as for the Neusel number. And this applies in the same Reynolds region for Reynolds numbers between the critical Reynolds number and 10 to the eighth. So if the Reynolds number was lower than the critical Reynolds number at the end of the plate, you wouldn't have a transition to turbulence. So you wouldn't need to use this expression anyway. That's kind of why that lower bound is there. Questions? So like uh, with many empirical convection correlations, these um, you can expect these correlations to be accurate to within like 25%. So pretty big margin of error. So we'll say can result in errors up to 25%. And this, um, the errors can be due to um, kind of small variations in the free stream turbulence, for instance, or the surface roughness. Okay, questions about flow over a flat plate. We're going to talk about cylinders next. Okay, so we're going to move on to talking about the cylinder in cross flow. So that means that flow is moving perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder. So you're going to have to start thinking, so we talk about a cylinder, the characteristic lengths, the Reynolds number, etc., are calculated using the diameter now rather than the length of the plate. So we're going to write um, expressions for like the diameter-based Reynolds number, diameter-based Neusel number. Okay, so first we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what the fluids around, um, uh, kind of the physical aspects of fluid flow around a cylinder and cross flow are. So we'll just kind of draw a little schematic of fluid motion normal to the axis of a cylinder. Okay, so we're looking at a cross section of a cylinder here. And we've got some upstream velocity, V, 
And we're going to make a distinction between the upstream velocity v and the free stream velocity u infinity because the cylinder acts to slow down the velocity as it approaches it. So for a flat plate, you just had kind of u infinity and v were equivalent. The upstream velocity maintained its same speed as it flowed across the cylinder or across the flat plate in the free stream, not in the boundary layer, but in the free stream. But here, the upstream flow is slowed down as it approaches the cylinder. So you have some fluid that kind of comes directly and impacts the cylinder kind of directly upstream, kind of on axis. And then there's going to be some flow that is slightly above the fluid center line and it's going to go around the cylinder and then similarly below the cylinder. So right here, the fluid here actually comes completely to rest. And so this is called a stagnation point. <coughs> and right at this stagnation point, the free stream velocity, u infinity, equals zero. And then you're going to have some flow. So you're going to flow moving around the cylinder. And these um, kind of flow lines, called streamlines, and we're going to define our x-coordinate as the streamline coordinate, so the um, x-location following a streamline. So that's x going around the cylinder. And then we'll show our u-infinity as being kind of any velocity in the free stream. So u-infinity is going to vary depending on your x and y location. And then, so you're going to have flow coming around the cylinder. And we'll talk about the boundary layer dynamics that cause this to happen. But it's going to separate, the boundary layer is going to separate from the body. And you're going to have a wake form. So you've got separation that occurs above and below the cylinder. And then this wake is defined by kind of irregular flow, vortex formation. Etc. So here we've got a stagnation point where the fluid has come to rest. Right here is our boundary layer that's developing around the cylinder. And then right here we've got our boundary layer separating from the solid body. So this is the separation point. And then we're going to define the angle at which the separation point occurs from the uh, forward angle. So this is just to show that this is the direction that we're defining theta. So the separation point in this case occurs like kind of way back here in that um, the point at which separation occurs depends on the flow, the Reynolds number of the flow, etc. Okay, so kind of important observations from this are at the stagnation point. The free stream velocity is zero. And because you're bringing the fluid to a rest, to rest, you have a corresponding increase in pressure. So the free stream velocity is zero and the pressure increases. And you actually have kind of a local maximum in the pressure. <coughs> so you have a maximum pressure locally at the forward stagnation point. 
And then past that, the pressure is going to start decreasing. Okay, so after the stagnation point, pressure decreases along a streamline. So dp dx is going to be less than zero. So the pressure change with respect to x, where x is the streamline coordinate, so you're going along the streamline, from the forward stagnation point to some kind of point up here, the pressure is going to be decreasing. And so that gradient is negative, and this is actually known as a favorable pressure gradient because it's working to accelerate the fluid. So the pressure and fluid gradients are reverse of each other. So if you think you have a really high pressure here and a lower pressure here, it's going to be kind of pushing the fluid. So you're actually accelerating the fluid around the front of the cylinder with this <coughs> favorable pressure gradient. Okay, so we'll say this is a favorable pressure gradient. And it's going to result in the free stream velocity along a streamline uh, actually increasing. And so right here, the boundary layer is developing under this favorable pressure gradient. So somewhere up near the top of the cylinder. Where exactly depends on kind of the Reynolds number and the specific flow conditions. But somewhere up here you have a local minimum pressure. So near the top, pressure reaches a minimum. And now it's starting to increase along a streamline. So near the top, pressure reaches a minimum and then increases along a streamline. So now we're going to have the pressure gradient. DPDX is going to be positive because the pressure is increasing with X. You can probably guess this is an adverse pressure gradient. So you've got a lower pressure <coughs> and then a higher pressure. And instead of pushing the flow forward, it's kind of acting against the momentum of the flow. So it's slowing it down. So it causes the weight. Exactly. That's what causes the boundary layer separation and then the wick to form. Yeah. So we'll draw kind of what the boundary boundary layer looks like really, really close to that separation point and why you actually have the separation. Yeah, so this is an adverse pressure gradient. So then the free stream velocity along a streamline is going to be decreasing, so the, the flow is slowing down. <coughs> 
And then, of course, at this um, kind of local minimum of the pressure, you're going to have a local maximum of the velocity. So it's speeding up and then slowing down. Okay, so let's draw, like I was saying, kind of a zoom in on just the very top of the cylinder to see what the boundary layer is doing. So we'll say this is the boundary layer near the separation point. Okay, so we've got top of the cylinder really zoomed in. And then we have the boundary layer. It's going to be relatively even upstream and then start to widen kind of right near the back where it starts to separate. So again, this exact location depends on the nature of the flow, the kind of somewhere upstream of near the top of the cylinder. We're going to have, remember we have the favorable pressure gradient. So favorable pressure gradient and then downstream we're going to have the adverse. <coughs> so that's going to correspond to dpdx is less than zero, du infinity dx is greater than zero. On the adverse side, dpdx is greater than zero, so the pressure is increasing. u infinity dx is less than zero, so the flow is slowing down. Okay. So we've got, let's say this is the cylinder, this is our boundary layer. And then over here, upstream of the top boundary layer development, we'll go past the region where we start to have an adverse pressure gradient. For a little while, you know, the flow is starting to slow, but it has some momentum, so it kind of continues. And then further on, basically the, mo the momentum of the velocity near the surface in the boundary layer isn't large enough to kind of withstand the pressure pushing it in the opposite direction. So you see an actual, like a zero gradient right here. So the flow is going to reverse. So first, if it reverses direction, it has to go through zero. And then regains the kind of free stream velocity. And this is the actual separation point. And then downstream, you're in the wake. The wake has started to form. And you actually have some flow reversal. And then, of course, the flow has to be um, 
you know, continuous, so it eventually regains the free stream velocity far enough away. You actually have some flow reversal down here, which is what gives rise to those vortices in the wake. So this is flow reversal. And then you've got vortex formation and the wake downstream of that. Okay. To be extra clear, we're going from left to right here. Let's put our upstream velocity on the left there. Questions about that? Okay, so the separation point is defined mathematically it's the point at which the velocity gradient at the surface equals zero so partial u partial y at y equals zero equals zero And that's consistent with what we saw up here of kind of the zero slope along um, the perpendicular uh, from the surface for a little while before the boundary layer kind of regains the free stream speed. And that's just because you have flow going forward and then you eventually have flow reversal. So obviously it has to pass through zero. So you've got the separation point and then detachment, um, the flow is detaching at the separation point and then the wake forming. So you can think, yeah, in the picture. So up here um, at the bottom of kind of the boundary layer profile here, it's just flat. So instead of having fluid moving forward, you just have zero velocity, and that's the separation point. So the um, Reynolds number primarily affects where this separation occurs. So it has to do with whether a flow, a boundary layer is laminar or turbulent. And like we talked about, turbulent flow has more mixing so you tend to have um, kind of the vortices from a turbulent flow will mix regions of higher momentum fluid down closer to the surface. So you have more momentum closer to the solid surface. So we talked about how the kind of the flow is losing momentum as it's working against this adverse pressure gradient, which is eventually what's causing it to stop and then reverse close to the surface. So if you have more momentum from a turbulent boundary layer, kind of mixing it in, it's gonna be able to stay attached for longer. So the, the flow will have more momentum and be able to kind of fight that adverse pressure gradient for further along the surface of the cylinder. So the separation point is um, strongly influenced by the Reynolds number. So Reynolds number of the flow influences where separation occurs. And as I said, for a cylinder, your Reynolds number is defined based on the velocity. So, or sorry, the diameter, the velocity and the diameter. But the diameter is the characteristic length. So rho VD over mu, which is of course equal to VD over nu. And then we'll say a turbulent boundary layer has more momentum and will stay attached longer. <laughs> 
So go back up to the picture here. We said that the flow is coming kind of around the cylinder here. And at this point, it's got a favor favorable pressure gradient. So it's being pushed by the pressure. And then when it passes um, kind of some critical location of minimum pressure, it's going to start fighting the pressure. So the pressure is now higher down here. And it's kind of trying to push the flow back. So the flow has some momentum coming around. And then that's fighting the pressure gradient. So eventually, the pressure gradient is going to kind of force the flow um, to have no momentum right at the surface and then eventually push it backwards. So a turbulent flow has more momentum in the boundary layer. So it will make it further along the cylinder until it separates. And that's going to have a big effect on the size of the wake and therefore the drag. So a turbulent boundary layer um, tends to have a much wider wake. Uh, sorry, a laminar boundary layer tends to have a much wider wake because the separation occurs earlier. And then turbulent boundary layer stays attached until later, so it has a narrower, narrower wake. Okay, so there's some kind of rules of thumb on again the kind of critical Reynolds number. So if the diameter base Reynolds number is less than approximately 2 times 10 to the fifth, the boundary layer will remain laminar. So there's just no transition to turbulence. And then that means that it has less momentum in the boundary layer and separation is going to occur earlier. And so it actually occurs at approximately 80 degrees. We call that theta. Okay. It's less than 2 times 10 to the 5th. It's laminar, and separation occurs at 80 degrees. Sorry. Our velocity profile doesn't tell us anything about whether it's turbulent or laminar. Um, you mean the one that we drew? Yeah, kind of like our representation. Of so, when we talked about the flat plate, um, we kind of drew how a turbulent uh, or a laminar boundary layer is a little like has a little bit, a little, a little bit of a lower slope, and then a turbulent boundary layer has a kind of sharp linear region, and then is kind of flat. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So this, um, so the the. I mean, the picture here is just kind of a generic boundary layer. Um, we're not specifically saying whether or not the flow is laminar or turbulent. Um, if you were perhaps given a problem where it was like sketched out the boundary layers and you could tell that it was a turbulent boundary layer, you could maybe conclude that, okay, this looks like a turbulent boundary layer and it's going to probably stay attached longer. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what I've drawn here is kind of more representative of, I guess, a laminar boundary layer. Yeah, but it wasn't supposed to be really one or the other, specifically. Because we weren't saying separation is occurring at a specific theta or anything. So the slope of that uh, velocity profile is essentially like the derivative, right? Like that's the acceleration of the velocity at that point. So like the rate of change of that. Um, Slope. Is that correlate to how fast? So you would need to basically see how that slope was changing with x position to okay. see how it's like accelerating. Okay. Sure. So we have the x position and the y position change, right? Yeah. So in the x position, it is going to change somewhat because the flow is accelerating, the boundary layer is developing. Yeah. But if you just look at one boundary layer profile at one x location, then you're looking at the change in y. Right. Yeah, which doesn't really tell you how it's kind of accelerating or decelerating in the streamline direction. What does it what does it tell us? The change in y over that velocity profile. So the change in y, um, well, really what it's used for is 
that like the slope d u d y right here is like directly plugged into to solve for like the convection coefficient and the friction coefficient. So boundary condition. Yeah, I mean, well, it's like this slope here directly influences the convection coefficient and friction coefficients. Um, it can also tell us, uh, I mean, like that's what it's used for computationally, I guess, like that's what you calculate from it. Qualitatively, if you're just looking at it here, you can kind of, it can kind of give you some indication of where the separation point is occurring. So I mean, also like mathematically, when it's equal to zero, that's where the separation point has occurred. And if it's negative, the flow has reversed. But as far as what we actually, like the calculations that we do, it's just the slope um, is plugged into the equation for H, basically. It's like directly in that equation. Okay, so if it's laminar, separation occurs at 80 degrees, yeah. I have a question about separation points. Okay. Out of the equation, why would you find the derivative to be in terms of one instead of in terms of x? So, in terms of y... Do we define y to be a perpendicular to the surface? Yeah, so y is... Okay, so, let's see. x is the streamline coordinate. Yeah, and then y is going to be perpendicular to the streamline at kind of any x location. Does that make sense? Uh, so it's, they're not, it's not exactly Cartesian coordinates. Yeah, but at the separation point, the velocity along the streamline should be zero. So why is it zero <coughs> y instead of x? So the velocity at the separation point at um, y equals zero is zero. But if you move either left or right of this, the velocity at y equals zero is gonna be either positive or negative. So the gradient with respect to x is not gonna be zero. So, so just to the left of this, so here see the velocity is positive at y equals zero. So it's gonna be positive, zero, negative. So the gradient isn't equal to zero with respect to x. At, but at the, ex at the separation point, the x location, <coughs> that exact x location, if you move away from the cylinder in the y direction, very briefly, we're talking like infinitesimally, right? The, the um, gradient is zero as you move away. Okay. So boundary layer separation occurs approximately at 80 degrees if it's laminar. If the Reynolds number is greater than two times 10 to the fifth, boundary layer transition occurs and separation. So now you have a um, laminar and then turbulent boundary layer. So separation is delayed until theta is approximately 140 degrees. So it's a pretty significant shift kind of forward of the very top of the cylinder and then well behind the very top of the cylinder, depending on if the flow is laminar or turbulent. So we're talking about all these boundary layer dynamics just like we did with the flat plate, because how the boundary layer develops changes what the slope of um, the boundary layer is right next to the y location and then that changes what your friction coefficient and your um, neutral number are. Uh, so 
We'll go into kind of specific expressions for the friction coefficient and Newell number on Wednesday, and then also talk about spheres. Um, and then tomorrow, we're going to do a couple practice problems for convection and midterm review.